Icon, I mentioned earlier, and I know you're learning that term. That's our next speaker is actually the one who coined that term, but that's not what he's going to talk about. But I would draw your attention to the screen to kind of describe what a sage con is not. And I can't find it in the Bible, but I use I quote it all the time, and I keep reading and reading the Bible. I know it's there someplace. It's supposed to be in Isaiah. But I heard Bishop say, um, to minister to the needs of God's creation is an act of worship. To ignore those needs is to dishonor the God who made us. It's there somewhere in some words or another, but certainly the spirit of it is there. That's why we pray, <laughs> we read, we vote, and we stand. Well, in my conversation earlier with uh, Josh and Aaron Holly, we discussed the desire among so many young families to raise spiritual champions. Well, our next speaker has literally written the book on that. This month, Dr. George Barna, who is a senior fellow at the Family Research Council and our Center for Biblical Worldview, released his latest book, Raising Spiritual Champions, Nurturing Your Child's Heart, Mind, and Soul. It reveals that who your child will be as an adult is essentially determined by the age of 13. Their core beliefs, their morals, their values, their desires, and their lifestyle. And based on extensive national research, George outlines a biblical approach to raising children with the seven cornerstones of, bibli of a biblical worldview. I cannot think of anything more important in this time than discipling children to be confident, courageous followers of Jesus Christ. Please welcome Dr. George Barna. Thank you so much, Tony. Good morning to all of you. I'm honored to be here today to talk to you about what's going on in America. We're going to talk about the future of America, but really uh, what that means is that we're going to be talking about children, because children are the future of America, and what we do with them today will determine that future. Now, I want to suggest to you that, you know, America is experiencing an existential crisis, but really the challenge is different than many people think it is. The nature of the challenge, it's not an economic challenge, it's not a border challenge, it's not a law enforcement challenge, it's not a health care challenge that's causing the existential crisis. What's causing it is that we've shifted the worldview that dominates in America. And why that matters is because every decision that every person makes every moment of every day of their life is based upon their worldview. So when you shift your worldview, you're naturally going to get different outcomes. And what we tend to do is to treat the symptoms rather than the cause of the crisis. And so it's imperative that we go back and we rethink this. Now, a lot of people challenge me on this, and they say, George, you know, it's a nice argument, but it doesn't hold water. Look at your own numbers. I mean, look at the fact that we've got 68% of American adults who call themselves Christians. That's 174 million people. That's huge. We couldn't possibly have a worldview problem. Or look at the number of people who, theologically speaking, could be described as born-again Christians. Not people who call themselves born-again, but people who say that when I die, I know I'll go to heaven, but only because I've confessed my sins and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. It's about one out of three adults. That gives us 90 million born-again Christians in America. That's massive. We could change any aspect of our culture with that group of people working together. So that can't, we can't have a worldview problem. Look at the number of people who believe in the existence of the God of Israel. I mean, that's literally half of the population of America, which I might add is down from 90% just 50 years ago. But we won't get into that. But look at the 50%. I mean, that's 128 million people. Look at the number of people attending Christian churches on any given week. Again, about a third of the population. Or we could look at how many people call themselves Christians and say that they believe that they are deeply committed to their spiritual faith. That's a, a significant number, 18%, 46 million. 
Now look at all of that. We've got more disciples than we need to create a moral and spiritual revolution in America. To which my response is, well, that's all well and good, but you're not describing disciples to me. None of these things constitute what a disciple is. And, and people might turn to me and say, well, uh, I, I don't believe that. And that's because of how we define disciple in America. As we did the research for this new book, Raising Spiritual Champions, we looked at that among parents and other people in America. And we said, what is a disciple of Christ? And what we got were some very common answers, one of which is, well, a disciple of Christ is a good person. And the problem is that the Bible tells us none of us are good. No, not one. You know, a lot of people say, a disciple is someone who believes in God. And the Bible says, don't be deceived. Even Satan believes that God exists. So that doesn't make you into a disciple. We have a lot of people say, well, you know a disciple by whether or not they attend church regularly. And again, when you read the scriptures, you have to understand that the Bible never calls us to go to church. It calls us to be the church. That's a lifestyle. That's a total life commitment. And there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, disciples come from Christian homes. Their parents were disciples, so naturally they become disciples. But of course, what we know is that discipleship is not something that you inherit. It's a lifestyle that you choose. It's a lifestyle that you practice. It's a lifelong commitment. I think the best way for us to solve this debate is to simply go back to Jesus himself and find out what he said a disciple is. There are six times in the course of the New Testament where Jesus said either you will be my disciple if or you cannot be my disciple unless. And those things that he describes in John 8, he says, you will be my disciple if you obey my teaching. In John 13, he goes on and he says, you will be my disciple if you love the other disciples. And then in John 15, he says, you will be my disciple if you produce a lot of spiritual fruit. In a passage in Luke, three times he says, you cannot be my disciple unless, and the first thing he says is, unless you love God so much, so deeply, so consistently, so profoundly, that it seems like all the other people you think you love, you actually hate in comparison. And then he says, and you cannot be my disciple unless you submit to my authority. When he talks about carrying your cross in Roman society, that would have meant you're submitting to authority. And then he finishes out by saying, and you cannot be a disciple unless you fully surrender your agenda and embrace God's agenda for your life. And so that's really what a disciple is. As we talk then about the Great Commission, what we call the Great Commission in Matthew 28, where we're supposed to make, go and make disciples of all the world and teach them to obey all the things that Jesus taught. What we know is that that's important. Why? Because it establishes your beliefs. Why does that matter? Because you do what you believe. If you want to know why Americans are making bad choices, which is an action, they're making it because they made that bad action. They had a bad philosophy. They had the wrong beliefs. But you do what you believe. If you didn't, you constantly be at odds with yourself. You would have a, a dissonance churning up with inside of you. And your life would always be uncomfortable. Nobody wants that. So we try to act consistently with what we believe. So understand what we're talking about is the development of your worldview. Your worldview is all those core ideas that determine every choice you're going to make, every moment of your life. Now the problem that we've got related to worldview is that in order to consistently think like Jesus, so that you can consistently act like Jesus, you have to have the same beliefs as Jesus. That's your worldview. And what we know in America today is that very few Americans have a biblical worldview. Most of the people attending Christian churches do not have a biblical worldview. Check this out. Most of the senior pastors who are teaching in our churches by our research do not have a biblical worldview. And so we have people standing in the pulpit teaching things other than God's truth under the label of God's truth 
to people who are hungry to know that truth. And so we're being misled always. The government is misleading us. Churches are misleading us. We have got to take this into our own hands. Recognize that it's statistically very rare, very rare, to find a disciple who does not have a biblical worldview. And so it's imperative that we recognize how worldview develops. It starts developing at 15 to 18 months of age. And a person's worldview is generally fully formed by the age of 13. Now, what do we do? We tend to wait until a person's an adult. We say, okay, then they can think, then they make important decisions. That's when we're really going to focus on them. It's too late. Their worldview has already been informed. And by the time they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, that worldview is in cement. Can it be changed? Yes, because the Holy Spirit can change any person at any moment. But it's incredibly difficult. What you have to do first is undo that existing worldview in order to replace it with something else. It's more than twice the task. And so we, we've got to understand that most people die with the same worldview that they had at the age of 13. So what does that mean? It means it's incredibly important for us to reach children. If we want to be effective in ministry, we cannot continue to invest the brunt of our resources into ministering to adults. Because adults, generally speaking, don't change. Who changes? Children. And so that's what we want to look at. But recognize that right now, a large majority of young people in America, people under the age of 18, are not attracted to the Christian faith, and they're not attracted to churches. We know that our research is showing that most of the children who are involved in the Christian church today will leave it by their mid-20s. And we also know that less than 1% of adolescents and teenagers are on track to have a biblical worldview. That's part of the research that we did for this book, Raising Spiritual Champions. But rather than being depressed, let's get smart and let's get busy. We can change this. You see, you can't fix something if you don't know it's broken. I'm here to try to help you understand what's broken and to rethink how we can change it. And so let's recognize that everybody has a worldview. Very few people have a biblical worldview, but everybody has a worldview. You need it just to get through the day because it's your decision-making filter. But recognize that we live in a competitive marketplace of ideas. And so when people are deciding what they want their worldview to embody, they don't choose only from what the scriptures teach, I wish. Instead, what they do is they operate in this competitive marketplace of ideas where there are other worldviews like postmodernism and marketism and secular humanism, Eastern mysticism and many others that are vying for their attention, vying for their vote, if you will. What we know is that currently very few Christian parents are focused on the development of their child's worldview. In fact, only 2% of the parents of kids under 13 in America have a biblical worldview. And the problem with that is you can't give what you don't have. And so we've got to change all of this. You see, the consequence of parents not intentionally helping their children to develop a biblical worldview is that that child's worldview develops by default. Essentially, what's happening is there is a vacuum there that's being filled by the world. And the world, predominantly through arts and entertainment media, is filling that worldview development vacuum with the ideas that it's promoting through its screens, hour after hour, day after day. And so it's incredibly important that we change that process. But how do we change it? Well, we've got to recognize, firstly, that the only people who can make disciples are disciples. Because you reproduce who you are. And so if you are a disciple, God is calling you to make other disciples. And if you are a parent, that is the highest calling that you have in your life, is to ensure that your child or your children become disciples of Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, we now know from the research, that means that you start with their worldview, you shape their beliefs, 
Why? Because you do, you do what you believe. And so if you get beliefs right, you can get action right. And if you get action right, you will get lifestyle right. And so, you know, we know that we're, you know, running uphill on this one because time is wasting. And we know that most parents themselves are syncretists. That is, they don't have a biblical worldview, but they also don't buy into Marxism, postmodernism, or any other particular worldview. What we all tend to do instead is to draw bits and pieces from many different worldviews, and we throw it together into a customized worldview that doesn't honor God, but it makes us feel comfortable and confident. And so we've got to change that practice of, of people embracing syncretism. Uh, you know, we know that most parents are inadequate role models. One of the things I talk about in the book is that how most parents have lost their kids' confidence because their children watch them to see, how should I live? And as they're watching their parents, they hear them say, do one thing. Or they hear them uh, say one thing, but then they watch them do another. And the conclusion they come to is, oh my gosh, my parents are as confused as I am. I guess they don't have the answers. And so why do arts and entertainment media, the movies, the music, the TV shows, the social media video clips, all those things, why do they have more impact than parents? Because they're consistent in the worldview that they promote. Kids are looking for answers and they're saying, who has the answers? And when they find somebody who is consistent, they say, okay, they've got it figured out. They're worth emulating. And so we have to add parents to that list of people. You see, the problem is that uh, we're, we're not leaving faith development up to God. We're leaving it up to chance. And we can no longer afford to do that. As I mentioned, most of our pastors do not have a biblical worldview. You can't give what you don't have. And so we've got issues there. In the book, I talk about the research we did with churches. One of the things we discovered is that one of the worst groups of pastors, if you will, in terms of worldview, are children's pastors. 37% of senior pastors, excuse me, 41% of senior pastors have a biblical worldview. Only 12% of children's pastors have a biblical worldview. That's one out of eight. So the most important pastors in the entire church, if you look at where are we gonna have impact on lives, impact that lasts for a lifetime, those are children's pastors. And seven out of eight of them don't have a biblical worldview. So we've got major issues there we need to deal with. So in the book I talk about, okay, so what can parents do? Where do they start? How do they move forward? What can we do to support them? And that's the local church's role, is to equip and support parents in this process. And I talk about the four different practices of effective disciple-making parents. And, and you know they come under the headings of the commitment that they have to make. You've gotta get in your head, first and foremost, you're not an employee, you're not a professional, you know, you're not a citizen, you're not a voter. You are a disciple maker, first and foremost. When you meet God at the end of your days, he's going to ask you about this. He's going to review this with you. What did you do to make other disciples? You had the privilege of being a follower of Jesus. How did you help other people to experience that same privilege? That is your top priority. And where you fulfill that first and foremost is in your home with your spouse and children. Thanks for the applause. I don't have time for it. Okay. I've got three minutes and I've got a lot to cover. So, uh, so what else do you have to have? Having that commitment in mind, critically important because that's your priority but it's not gonna happen if you don't have a plan. What we discovered through our research is that fewer than one out of every 10 born again Christian parents of kids under 13 has a plan for the spiritual development of their children. Fewer than one out of 10. It doesn't happen by mistake. You've got to know what you're gonna try to do, how you're gonna do it, how you're gonna handle the pitfalls and the sidesteps and all the other challenges you're gonna face. You know, in addition to that, you've got to think through the beliefs that you need your children to embrace. 
You've got to think through how are you going to convert those beliefs into a behavior, a lifestyle that honors Jesus Christ, that moves the kingdom of God forward, that is true to his holy word. And then finally, you've got to have a way of knowing, is it working? Is what you're doing working? And that's measuring the process. And I've got a chapter in the book about measuring that process, what you can look at, how you can look at it, how critical it is. Otherwise, you're basing it on feelings and impressions. Don't do that. They're misleading. And so we can do a better job of all this. And part of the way that I suggest that you move forward with that belief aspect is I describe this thing that I discovered in the research called the seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview. In doing all my worldview research, as I've been doing for more than 30 years now, what I've discovered is that there are seven particular beliefs that if you believe those seven things, all seven of those, and they're very, very basic biblical precepts, but if you believe them, you've got an 80, 83% probability of developing a complete biblical worldview. If you do not buy all seven of those basic beliefs, you've got only a 2% probability of going on and developing a biblical worldview. Where does a parent start with their children? Start with the seven cornerstones. They're very basic beliefs, and I describe them in detail in the book. Okay, but I, I do it for you now, but I've got 52 seconds left. So, um, so I want you to know that that's a great starting place. And parents say, but I don't have a biblical worldview. I can't do this. Yes, you can. Your kids don't know the difference of whether or not you have a biblical worldview. You've only got to be 10 seconds ahead of them, okay? And, 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 and so what you've got to do is you embrace these seven cornerstones, and then you build from there. But as you go through that process, bring your kids into that process with you. Let them see how discipleship happens. Let them see that everybody is called by Jesus to be a disciple. In the book, there's a lot more. I've listed some of the things somewhere on the screen. Um, so hopefully all of that will be helpful to you. I, this may be the most important book I've ever written because I think it deals with the future of America. If we don't get discipleship right, there's no way that we're going to turn America around. All these things that we're trying to do in Congress, in state houses, and elsewhere, incredibly important. But they're stopgap measures. We're going to have to keep fighting for those things year after year after year if we don't have kids who grow up to be citizens who vote based on a biblical worldview and who are going to fight for the right things. We're going to lose the battle if we don't do this. Thank you so much.